hit the record to the cloud. I love y'all, but I'm gonna mute you real quick. Word. I I I um cat what's going on? Uh all right, everybody. Uh appreciate you guys uh checking in, coming in and uh doing your thing. Lisa, how you doing? Uh David, how's it going? So I appreciate you guys coming in here. Jelani, what's up? And getting this knowledge because it's important for the village, right? Um not so much just you, but it's important for the village that we 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 understand this stuff. Uh, no matter what part of the world you're you're in right now, no matter um, who you are, or your background, what you look like, what you grew up with, it's still important to your village that you learn this stuff. You become proficient in it and you become practitioners. You don't just um, uh, learn about the theory, but we actually apply some of these things. Um, and, and and help our family and help our village, right? Whatever that is and wherever that's at. Um, so we're gonna be talking today about some uh, another um, another creative real estate tool. It's something that uh, a lot of people are already talking about. Um, people have uh, some mystery about what it is. They don't really understand how it works and how you can get into properties that you can't wholesale. Um, and so what we're going to be talking about today is subject twos. Has everybody heard of a subject two? Subject two properties. Some people say yes. Some people say no. Does everybody know exactly how they work? Some people kind of no, no, no. I don't see any, any real yeses. Okay, perfect. So this is a good, good thing to talk about. Okay. Um, we're working on a subject two right now. Um, my brother, Josh. Um, I forgot how we found that. I don't know. I can't remember, Josh. Uh, I forgot how we found that property. Um, I don't know if it was a driving for dollars property. Anyway, um, I forgot how we found this property, Mr. Um, Mr. George. And uh, he is, um, he was going through a divorce evictions list. Okay. So Josh told me it was through the eviction list. So you guys remember last week or last Wednesday, I was with Deanna. And um, if you guys didn't see that, you can go back to the, um, the, the Facebook page and look at that. But was with Deanna. She does um, law clerk on demand and she does probate, eviction, divorce list, all those things. So this was an eviction list that I bought maybe a month, no, maybe two months ago. Um, and so that eviction list, um, we just, all our lists, we just call every once in a while, every, every month on the beginning of the month is when we, we were going to re recall these things. And so that, that list is something, I mean, that eviction list that most people would have never called again is going to uh, yield. Matter of fact, we just got the word from the buyer yesterday that she wants it. So um, we just got to verify one, uh, one more thing and then it's going to be a wrap. So, um, and she's getting this subject too. So here's, here's this picture. I want to paint this picture to you guys, right? So you find a property, eviction list, driving for dollars, probate, whatever the case may be. They owe 160 on it. Um, or I'm sorry, the property is worth, take that back, the property is worth 160. Let's say they owe uh, about 140 on the mortgage. Doesn't really fit the criteria for a wholesale deal. There's not enough equity. It's probably, if anybody tells you that there is no um, repairs that need to be done on the property, they're probably lying to you, okay? Or maybe they just don't know, they're just, they don't understand that if you're gonna to get top dollar, if I'm gonna get the ARV, which should be based off of the, the best comps in that neighborhood, um, then I have to make it look like the best houses in the neighborhood. So most people don't understand that. So even though that $20,000 to the untrained eye looks like it's a good amount of money, it's not. Remember, if we're gonna do our, if you go into the course, you'll see what, you'll see what is needed, that 70% or that 30% gap is, is what's needed, right? So it's obviously not there if they owe, I mean, if the property is ARVing at 160 and they owe 140 and it might take, let's just say a light, you know, 15, uh, 10 to $15,000 to get it up into that ARV range, right? So the pro there's not enough margin there. Is it a dead deal? Well, maybe it's not, okay? And here, here comes this thing called subject two. And so what basically a subject to property is, 
is when we take over and show ownership of the property, but we do, we're not on the mortgage. It's really that simple. Meaning that, uh, I'm just gonna pick some names here. All right, Lisa, Lisa has now deeded me the property, okay? But the mortgage stays in Lisa's name. Now, here's the crazy thing. When you get a car, when you get a car and you finance a car, your name and whoever you're financing with, GMAC, CarMax, whoever your finance company is, Chase Bank, whoever they are, they are both, both you guys are on the deed together, right? You joined at the hip, okay? But with property, it's different. And that's why sometimes people don't understand this. With property, it's different. You can, someone can literally owe a million dollars on a home, deed you the property, okay? They owe a million dollars to the mortgage, deed you the property, and now you have ownership of the property. Now, if something like that happens, the, the bank is definitely gonna be fighting you with that. But I just wanna get you to understand that at, at its core, that's the concept. You can sit at a kitchen table with someone. You don't need a lawyer. You don't need title companies. If, every, if there's a meeting of the minds, you literally can buy someone's property at their kitchen table, okay? All right, there's no rule that says you have to use a closing attorney or you have to use a title company, although that is preferred and most people would do that just to cover themselves, okay? But in this particular case, an individual can deed you over, to, over their property still show liable and responsible to the mortgage, but they're going to be protected. They're going to be protected. And we're going to show you some of these things through these clauses that I, I um, eventually, I, I guess I'll probably put them into the course so you guys can take a look at them as well. But I want to walk you through this process and make sure that you're painting this picture. So someone um, like our client that we're working with, um, he's going through some, some issues in his life, right? I'm not gonna put all his business out there. You know, you, you'll never know who he is anyway, but He's going through some issues in his life. Um, and he has two properties. One's getting ready to be sold. And this one, no one's living in. And he doesn't want anymore. Okay. But he has a mortgage on it. And I think he's paying, I think it's $1,200, no, $1,200 a month. He's paying $1,200 on a month that no one's renting. And then no one's living in. And it's a problem. So what, it, what he did is he decided to let it go in default. He just stopped paying the mortgage. Now, after a couple of months, you do that one month, you're gonna get a little letter. Going in that second month, banks will get a little worried. They're gonna send you some more letters. And his bank is moving pretty quick, or the owner, the financing company is moving pretty quick. What they have done now, they said, listen, we're gonna put this thing and we're gonna foreclose on this thing. We're not playing around. You need to pay us our money. Okay. So he he's he hasn't paid for, I think this is the yeah, March is the third month. So it's 1200 for the first month, 1200 for the second month. So we're at 24. Now he's $3,600 in the rears, okay? $3,600 in the rears he owes just to catch up to get to, you know, get to pay on time. He's saying, listen, I don't care about this property. I don't want it. I just need, just, let's just let this thing go. I don't care. He's prepared to do that, but he'd rather, if he can save it, he can save his credit and not have a foreclosure on his credit. Does it make sense? Okay. So we come in and we say, listen, you don't have enough equity in there where we can just outright sell this thing and be done with it. Your only options are either what you're doing right now, which is going to lead you to foreclosure and a negative stain on your credit. And you're not going to be able to, you know, it's going to be on there for seven years, or um, we can help you out and do a subject to with this property. But with this subject to, you have to deed us the property because we're going to, uh, we're going to start investing some money into it. And without us having uh, ownership of the property, it does not make sense. Now, for some people, I've gone through this process before, and they say, no, I'm not going to deed you my property and then, keep, and then keep my name on the mortgage and be responsible to make the, the mortgage payments. That doesn't make any sense. That's what they say. It's only because they don't understand it. And you have to explain it to them in a way that they understand. And so how I do that is say this, listen, um, I am going to be invested into your home just like you're invested into your home. And so when we take, when we do this, I need to have, there needs to be some checks and balances on both sides. Here is the check on my side. Okay. I'm going to catch you up on your mortgage. So in this particular case with Mr. George is $3,600. I'm also going to put money in your pocket. So I'm going to give you an extra 2,500 bucks. Okay. 
And then I have to spend maybe $10,000 to do a light rehab so I can get it into rental ready shape so that we can rent this thing out and make money off of it. I am not going to spend $10,000 on rehab, $2,500 going to your pocket, and then $3,600 on a mortgage just to walk away. That'd be stupid. No one's going to waste, you know, $16,000, $17,000. So that's the check on my side. That's where I'm putting my, the skin in the game. That's where I'm investing in. On your side, all you have to do is give me your information to your bank, which I'm going to show you how we do this. Give me your information in your bank so I can make the payments. And after I make the payments for the next, however long the, 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 um, the loan is for, the property will be completely mine. You don't have to worry about an eviction. I'm sorry, you don't have to worry about a foreclosure. You don't have to worry about making any more payments. But here's, here's where if I stop making payments. So if I default as the investor and I stop making payments on your house, Mr. George, guess what? You're caught up on your mortgage, right? And we've just invested $10,000 into fixing your property. And there's a tenant in place. So you have a lot of checks on your side as well. And all I need is a signature saying that you're going to deed the property to me. Some people are going to get that. Some people are not going to get it and still do it because they have no other choice. Their only choice is, man, I got, I'm facing foreclosure in like three weeks. Let's just make this thing happen. Okay. There's a house right now in Savannah that we were reached out to. We did for an RVM. The guy is trying to do a subject too. It's going to be a kind of tough one because of how, how far, how long he waited. Okay. He's now almost 30,000, actually is $30,000 um, behind on his mortgage. That's a tough one, but it's a very, very, very nice house. So that's the only hope that we have for it. But he wants to do it. He doesn't, he said, listen, I don't want nothing. I just don't want to have the, I just don't want to deal with having a foreclosure on my, on my, on my credit. Okay. So that's the value that's, that's provided. Again, subject to real simple, the investor gets deeded the property, but is now responsible for paying the mortgage, but is not legally responsible for paying the mortgage. Okay. We're responsible because we've now invested into this property, but legally the person who is actually assigned that mortgage, that debt. Okay. Cause that's what mortgage is. Uh, the person who's legally assigned that debt is the still, still the same homeowner and their name will stay in the, in, on that mortgage until the house is paid off or until whatever you guys agree upon. Okay. So how do we do this? We found someone, we found the perfect candidate. They're, they're saying oh, they're going to do this. Right. Well, I don't want them to see your face. Take it off. Of it. That's What's that? Just... Take your face off of it. Erase it. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. I'm about to put all their business out there, boy. Um, so, um, <laughs> never mind. I'm not even going to. Sometimes my mind, I just, these jokes come in and I probably shouldn't say it. Um, so, um, man, that threw me off. Uh, okay. So, we're going to, um, what we're going to do is we need to get some information because we want to, um, I'm going to get to your questions. I, I got your questions here, but if, if I start asking questions, I'll go off on a tangent and I'll never get to the whole point. So I got you. Um, so remember the dude, remember the dude, remember the dude. Going on? Somebody keep taking themselves off mute and I don't, I don't know if I can hold these jokes in for too much longer. All right. So be careful. Um, so someone, <laughs> They're telling you that they owe, in this particular case, like we said, right? They say that they're owed 140, but who really owes exactly 140 on their mortgage? They're rounding, they're probably rounding down, okay? Um, who owes, whose mortgage payment is exactly $1,200? They're probably rounding down, okay? So we need to um, verify. We need to trust them but we still need to verify. We don't ever want to make them feel like we're just, we're calling them liars, but we, we need to verify. So let me, um, hold up, the wrong thing. All right. Oops, that's not what I want. This is in the way, of course. This is in the way. Uh, where is it at?
All right. Boom. Okay. So we're going to get this thing called authorization to release mortgage information, right? This is the exact same thing, same one we used on with Mr. George. Um, really, 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 really self-explanatory. The whole purpose of this, this, um, this document is to give myself or you, the person who's trying to work this deal, give that person authority to talk to the mortgage company directly. Right? Because again, we're going to trust, but we're going to verify. So we're going to put the address here, the lender service, whether it's GMAC or whoever, Chase Bank, Bank of America, whoever it is, the loan number, a contact number for who, to, who uh, we're going to call, and this right here, okay, to whom it may concern, this letter authorizes the release of any and all mortgage information and or mortgage payoff information or request it to, and this I would put Thomas Holt, or you would put whatever your name is, all right? Then here is the borrower or the seller. So in our seller right now, his name is George. And you put George in his last name, date, his social security number. If there is a co-borrower, their, their name right here, their date and their social security number. Because what the mortgage company is gonna ask for is this loan number and probably the last four of the social security number, okay? The loan number and the last four of the social security number. That's what they're gonna ask about. And so, this is gonna get filled out and you'll either fax it or email it over to whoever this contact number is, right? So you fax it or, more, or, or email it to them. They'll see that it's, it's signed. They'll see that they have a social security number here. They'll see they have the loan number here. And then you'll be put on to the, um, uh, you'll put, put a note in there that, hey, Tommy Holt is allowed to speak on, on uh, Mr. George's behalf in reference to getting this information. I can't change or modify anything. I, don't, I can't do any of that. Only thing I can do is um, get information. And so really, really what I wanna know is this, and this is where you guys wanna to take some notes if you're not already. You're already gonna have loan numbers. You're already gonna have all this. You're gonna need obviously the exact payoff amount, okay? So that's different than what's currently, what's the principal balance. So a lot of people mix that up, right? because the payoff amount is going to include other things because obviously unless you're paying it that day there's going to be interest that's accrued and so they'll normally push that out for about 30 days okay the other thing is that there's escrow all right so a lot of people um instead of uh paying their taxes and their insurance uh separately the the mortgage company will require you to put that in escrow so let's say your taxes and insurance all come up to you know, $1,500 a year. Well, you're going to be required to pay more on, and some, some banks do it differently. Some people, some banks will make you pay up front for the year. Some of them will say, listen, I need you to pay a little bit more throughout um, um, the first couple of months. Some of it is evened out throughout all your payments. However, they, however they do it, it'll be, you know, delineated in the contract um, in for, for that bank. Okay. But if, someone was just paying the mortgage and now they're $2,000 negative on the escrow, which means they, they haven't been paying into their escrow account. All right. Well, that's going to, that's going to show up as well. So um, you want to get the exact payoff. You don't want to have to guess. You want to know down to the penny what it is going to take to pay it off. So that's the other thing. Other thing with that payoff, you want to know how long are you going to be responsible for this loan? Is it 15 years? Is it six years? Is it another 30 years? Did they just get this, like all that stuff is important, okay? Um, you wanna know the, obviously the pay, the monthly um, mortgage payment. And does that mortgage payment include what we call P-I-T-I, -I, all right? Principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. So the, you might ask the homeowner, how much is your mortgage payment? And they might tell you, oh, it's $800. And they're absolutely telling you the truth because the actual mortgage is really the debt that's owed to the bank, all right? But they might not have included the, the taxes and the insurance, okay? So you wanna make sure that um, that, that, mortgage company, uh, that mortgage payment is including all of those things. You wanna find out what the interest rate is on that mortgage, all right? You want to know what the interest rate is that you're paying on because that's going to obviously affect because you are now going to be the person who's responsible um, for paying that uh, every single month. 
And if you want to know if I am I getting a good deal or am I getting a bad deal? Okay. Um, you want to know if there is any um, homeowners association dues. So you might have again, guy has maybe if he had maybe well this person he doesn't because it's a single family home. So and it's not a community. But let's say again eight hundred dollar a month um, mortgage payment. Um, but there's a three hundred dollar homeowner association fee a month. All right. It's crazy. I when I lived in, I bought a condo in in uh, Florida in Homestead. Um, I bought it. I literally bought it. Like a week later, I got deployed. Um, I was gone for a hundred days. I came back. My I bought it when I, I'm sorry. I bought it, uh, and when I signed the paper, it was a hundred and ten dollars a month for my homeowners association. I got deployed for a hundred days. I came back. They tripled it. So now what I was expecting to pay $110 every single month, it was now $330, actually it's $333. I remember it, it's crazy. $333 they, 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 raised, they raised it to. So homeowners association, you want to know, do they have a homeowners association? You want to know how strong their homeowners association is? Do they have any reserves in case things happen? Um, what, what has been the history of that? Now that's going to be something that you're going to, the bank will know whether or not there is an HOA, all right? but they won't know some of that information. Some of that information you might have to get in contact with the HOA to, to ask some of those questions, okay? Um, so we got the principal, we got interest, we got HOA, um, taxes, insurance, um, obviously the condition of the home, okay? All right, and every, every single mortgage company, every single mortgage company is gonna have something called a due on sale clause, okay? Due on sale. And so this is where um, you, number one, I want to make sure that you don't bring this up. Don't bring up the due on sale clause when you're talking to them. You're just going to be asking them those questions. What are the interest rate? How much do they pay? Um, those, that type of information, right? But it's important to know that there is a due on sale clause and what that actually means. So a due on sale clause is something where if the bank gets wind or understands or finds out that um, someone is, uh, has been deeded the property. So there's a change of ownership that they have the right to, um, make, uh, make the, whoever it is, what in, in this particular case it would be the, um, the person who originally got the mortgage and in, in this story we're talking about, his name is George. They have the right to make George pay the entire lump sum up. So if George owes $140,000 and the bank decides to exit and they find out that I am now deeded the property. So there's been a change of ownership. All right. All right. There's been a change of ownership. So there's been a definitive point in time where ownership went from George in the bank to me now. And George still owns the mortgage to the bank. If the mortgage finds out about that and cares enough, that's the key. They can go to Mr. George and say, you now owe us $140,000 immediately. So do on sale clause. So this is one of the things that um, an educated seller might have a problem with and a buyer or an investor might have a problem with. But it's something that very, very, very rarely ever happens. It's one of those things that the bank is not in the, busi not in the business, in the, in the, in the uh, real estate business. They're in the money business. Um, houses cost money. They're, they're, they, until they're paid off and until they're either lived in or being rented out, really, really a lot of them are still liabilities because people buy, they, they overbuy. They don't buy smart like you guys are going to buy smart. So they don't want the house. They want the money. Okay. And so if there is a substantial amount of equity in the property, this is where you might see this a little more frequently. I'm talking about 50% or more of equity. But if there's not, if there's not, then you probably are not going to see this. But you got to understand if there was 50% or more equity, you probably could get away with wholesaling it if the, and the person with the person being in such dire straits. Okay. So um, that's important stuff to know. So that's the things that you're going to uh, look out for. Okay. Now I'm going to show you one other thing. Um, this addendum Okay, addendums for subject two. I'm gonna go through these things. It's a it's a couple of bullet points. The red red the 
uh, the red words are things that are, you know, just basically explaining why this is important, okay? So this is an example. Let's say we're gonna give them $10, we're gonna give them $100, we're gonna give them $1,000, whatever. A check in the amount of $10 in this particular case shall be deposited into the escrow account of the attorney for the buyer, uh, the receipt of which will, will be acknowledged by the attorney for the buyer, the deposit of blah, 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 10 bucks, right? All right, so this is, this is um, important, remember? Because I think a couple of weeks ago, we talked about um, some of the aspects of a contract. There has to be consideration made. So as soon as I make this consideration, which is 10 bucks in this particular case, I am, we are now coming with the, the meeting of the minds and now me and Mr. George understand that this is a legal contract because he's gonna sell. He's intelligent, he's over 18, he understands what's going on. And I am now providing some type of consideration, but I'm not giving it to Mr. Mr. George because there's no record of that. I'm gonna give it to the closing attorney or the attorney that we're gonna use um, in this particular case, it's going to be held in an escrow account. All right. Um, uh, the property is being purchased subject to the existing first mortgage currently owned or collected by whoever in the mortgage, GMAC, Chase, Bank of America, whoever that is. The seller represents the principal balance of the first mortgage as the date of settlement shall be no more than blank dollars. And you will verify this amount using authoriza authorization release form that we had on that for that uh, first um, uh, file. This, this property is being purchased subject to the, exist, the existing second mortgage. So this is in case, because not everybody has a first and second mortgage. Um, if you guys don't know, uh, some, you, can get, you can have a bank that says, We're, we like this property, we like you, we don't like you enough to put all of our eggs in one basket. So what we'll do is you're asking for a mortgage of 200,000, we'll give you 150 and you'll have to find another bank or institution to give you the rest of the fifth, the remaining 50. So that would be a second mortgage, right? So if there is a second mortgage, obviously you're gonna list it there and then you're gonna list the amounts. The exact same thing you do with the first mortgage, you're gonna put it here. If there isn't, then obviously you would remove this portion out of it, okay? In addition to purchasing the property subject to the first and second mortgage, buyer shall pay the balance of the purchase price amounting to whatever that dollar amount is. Within five years of date of settlement, seller will receive approximately blank dollars in cash or certified funds on or before whatever the date is. Now here's, this is something where um, you would, try, if the person does have equity and you're trying not to actually give them money or a large sum of money um, up front, you're saying, listen, I'm gonna take over this property. Um, I am going to, invest putting some money into it you're actually going to get a little bit more money on the back end but you're going to have to get it over time okay because we're going to spend some money on it we're going to take over the mortgage payments you're not going to, have to pay the mortgage so you can go on about your life about that but as we get renters in there and everything start to make some money we're going to pay you x amount of dollars within five years remember this is all changeable you can just you can remove that and you can put one year you can put two years whatever you want to put okay it's what you decide to work out within that, with that seller, okay? Um, the purchase price of this property is strictly pre, pre, um, predicated and contingent on the buyer paying a total of no more than blank dollars So, uh, or for the property. Should there be any additional liens, mortgages, and or judgments existing on the property at the time of the settlement, it shall be responsible of the seller to pay these amounts. This is pretty straightforward. If we find out, Mr. George, owes $140,000 exactly. I'm saying, listen, this whole deal is predicated upon that. If we find out that you're doing, that you actually had another $30,000 in liens that you didn't tell us about, or that you didn't know about, that's on you. You're responsible for that. Um, there will be no cash due to seller at closing. You're only gonna use this if you're not gonna give the seller at closing. Like Mr. George, we're gonna give him 2,500, okay? Um, and again, I explain, I explain that five to 10 years. Once again, you can change this however you see fit. Might be a year, might be two years, whatever you think. Uh, buyers taking over seller's mortgage payment amount of $1,200 a month, whatever. Buyers only responsible for the amount for the first five years after settlement. If interest rates increase during that first five years, sellers require to cover any, over, any amount over their current monthly payments of whatever that is, $1,200 in this particular case. Should the interest rate increase, on a property, seller will immediately be notified in writing and will be required to cover the difference 
If seller does not cover any increase above blank amount, then the buyer has the option to stop making the mortgage payments and the property may be foreclosed on and the seller credit may be severely damaged. So this is gonna be used only, only if there is an adjustable rate mortgage. That's what this ARM stands for, adjustable rate mortgage, all right? That, um, so if there's an ARM and, and ARMs are normally five years, are normally like five, five year chunks, at that end of that fifth year, the mortgage rate, the mortgage will be, um, everything will be, they'll look at it and it might go down, but most of the time it goes up, okay? So they're saying, listen, at five years, if, I'm, I'm saying I'm paying 1200, but if this thing jumps up to 1600, you're gonna be responsible for that additional $400, the difference between 1200 and 1600. Or if it jumps up to 1500, you're gonna be responsible for the difference between 1200 and 1500, which is $300. Seller will allow purchaser to place a sign on the property prior to closing for prospective tenants or purchasers. Purchase may advertise or market said property in any means until settlement. This includes public auctions or any other means of advertisement. This is good to do because you want to start moving this property, whether or not you're going to try to rent it or whether or not you're going to try to sell it on the open market. However you want to do it, you want to be able to start doing that. And it's cool if you can get that done even before you even take possession of it. Okay have that re ready to go. Um, purchaser is purchasing property with the intent to rent, lease, trade, or sell property for a profit, okay? This is giving you 100% full disclosure that what you're doing, you are an investor, you're letting them know that, they can't say that they didn't know that you were trying to do this. With regard to the existing mortgage, if buyer fails to make any payment on any such mortgage, uh, when such payment is due and such failure continues to for more than 30 days after the due date, the seller shall have the right to require buyer to convey property back to the seller upon written request. At settlement, the party shall execute and deliver to the settlement agent documents and funds sufficient to recover the property to the seller together with any appropriate escrow agreement. So this is an important one because this is um, basically telling the seller, if I, the buyer, do not make payments, we're gonna revert this property back to you. Okay. All right. So, uh, don't save and stop sharing. All right, cool. We back. Um, there's a lot of information, a lot of information. Um, so I do see that we have some stuff here in the chat. Uh, okay. Is the seller going to the county to record and transfer the deed? Yes. Or, yeah, yes, yes. So if, wherever that deed is held, okay, depending on which state you're at, wherever that deed is held. Uh, does the uh, investor just continue paying the mortgage for perpetuity? Man, I just learned that word too. Um, until it's paid off. Yes. So you're going you're gonna to just keep um, uh, paying the mortgage. So like, again, you know, Lisa, Lisa is the, the person who's, who's selling me this property or we're doing this deal. Um, I'm going to say, Lisa, how do you pay your mortgage? Most people nowadays pay their mortgage where? online, right? So I'm saying, Lisa, just shoot me over your login. You don't care anymore, right? Um, you're about to be out. You're about to move on with your life. So shoot me over your, your, your the email and the login. It's really good when you could do that because then they get the email too, showing that their mortgage was paid, right? So shoot me over your, your email and your login. And I just literally hop on the computer and the mortgage company doesn't know the wiser. They don't know who the heck, all they know is that they may, you know, Lisa's mortgage payment was made, okay? And you're just going to keep doing that over and over and over until the, until the house is paid off. Now, um, ideally, you're doing this because you're smart, right? You're not just paying someone's house just to be paying it. You're doing it because there's, there's a reason to do it. Either, either the, typically what people do is, um, and what our investor is doing is they do a, they're doing a, um, a, um, a lease option. So they're doing a subject to with our seller. They're gonna get that property. They're gonna spend about $10,000 to get into this particular property. And then, they're going to do a lease option with someone else and a lease option with someone else is probably due because they have cash, they have the money, but they probably don't have the credit. So what they'll do, especially now, this is a perfect time because it's tax season, right? So you get someone who has $8,000, $10,000 in their taxes and they find this house and they're like, man, I love this house. I want to do a lease option. Okay. So then, you know, our, our, our investor, her name is Alana. Alana goes ahead and Alana is all in this property for $10,000, right? She caught the mortgage back up, she's paid us our fee, and we're good to go. And now, 
and now Alana is out of pocket 10,000, but she finds someone who wants to do a lease option who's willing to put up $10,000 up front as an option. We talked about what a lease option was, right? A couple of weeks ago. They're putting a $10,000 option fee up. So she gets all her money back, okay? And they're gonna rent the property for the next 12, 24 months. So that's, that's why a lot of people do it, okay? So yes, so the investor is going to do that. Um, they're gonna keep paying it until it's paid off or they'll sell it. Is it subject to assignable? Yes, that's exactly what we're doing. That's exactly what I'm doing. We're not, we're not buying this property. We're assigning it to um, Alana, who's our investor. Um, okay, Josh already answered that, so I'll shut up. Um, can I share this contract? Yes, I'll put it into the uh, Facebook group. Um, and then uh, I'll try to put it on the uh, joint to the, um, the course. Um, so make it difficult for them to get another mortgage carrying that liability on their credit. It could. It could make it more difficult for them to get a little mortgage. But no, it's going to make it real difficult. Foreclosure. Right? Um, in this case, Mr. George had another problem. Okay, he's already. Uh, how do you avoid the liability of due on sale clause? You keep your mouth shut. <laughs> um, you just you just make make normal payments. Don't be late on the payments. Um, uh, the, like I said, the bank really don't care. And if again, it's going to look like in the case I'm talking about with Lisa, right? It's going to look like Lisa's paying her mortgage, right? Because I'm logging in through her her login, right? And just make the payments. Um, yeah, Sean said because he had that out. He had that with uh, his property. Make sure you check for second mortgages or HELOCs. Check for anything, right? Check for anything that's, that could, you know, come up. To the bank, uh, to the bank, the house is a liability, the mortgage debt is an asset, yep. Um, would this be in the files or Facebook? We're, no, we're gonna, we'll put it in there. Do you still get a due diligence period? Um, I always put a due diligence period. <clears throat> Here's the beautiful thing about this. And Josh is starting, to, Josh is in it because he's in this deal so he can see it. Um, the sellers, they 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 want to work with you right they like they need this um for them that it's more important to them that they cooperate than it is to uh you kind of have the upper hand just put it like that um so you as a buyer doesn't oh shoot somebody wrote something and i lost my spot um so you as a buyer doesn't get pro don't get profit until it's sold um yes as a buyer now we're assigning this. So I'm still operating right now in this particular case between Mr. George, myself, and Alana. I'm actually acting as the wholesaler, and we're going to receive a wholesaling fee, an assignment fee, okay? But if I'm the buyer, yeah, I'm not going to receive any money off this thing. This is an investment. I'm going to put up $10,000 to get to this property as an investment, and then however, whatever my investment strategy is, that's how I'll get paid, okay? So, because of where this property is, Alana could Airbnb it, which probably to me would be the smartest thing because it's not that far away from the airport. Uh, probably make more money. Or she can do what she wants to do. She's talking about doing lease options, okay? Um, or she could put it on the open market. She could rent it out for a little bit and put it on the open market, okay? So there's a couple different options she has there. Uh, will the buyer get title search done prior to get? Yes, yes. You definitely want to get the title search done in case. Um, Sean, Sean can talk about that, um, how that works for sure, because he has some issues with his. That's why he said, make sure you check for second mortgages and HELOCs. Hi, everyone. Tommy, I am not sure, not for sure if it's on my part. I cannot hear you anymore. Oh, can everybody hear me? Yeah, Jasmine, I hate to say it. Might be you. Um, maybe just try to hang up. I don't, man, you probably wrote, you wrote that at, a while ago. So just hang up and uh, maybe uh, come back on. Is assigning a subject to proper, uh, subject to pretty common. And this is a common mistake. And I, I know you just threw it in there, right? But don't do that. Don't, um, Keith, I'm not calling you out. Love you, brother. But um, it's subject to with TO. It's not the number two. But if you do that, then somebody will know that you don't know what you're talking about. So um, we're here to learn, right? Um, as assigning a subject to pretty common, um, in the grand scheme of things, I wouldn't say it's the most common thing. It's definitely more common to do a wholesale, but, um, uh, you know, it happens quite often. So it's not something that's like completely foreign. Uh, is your strategy not to transfer the deed into your company name as to avoid triggering due on sale? When I say um, 
transfer the deed into my name. I didn't mean like me, Tommy Holt. So if my company, I would transfer it into my company's name. Um, but if you don't have a company, then you're going to transfer it into your, your personal name. Uh, so we're just trying to, to do, do on sale. The only time it's going to come up is if the bank goes looking for it. And they're only going to go looking for it if you give them a reason to go looking for it. And even here's, and remember what I said, even if they find it, as long as they're, as long as you're paying the, the, um, as long as you're paying the, uh, the mortgage, most of them ain't going to care because they don't want to deal with it. They just want to make their money. Okay. Uh, do you get your title report? Yes. Get a title, get a title search done. When does the money clear escrow for the seller? Once everything is signed. So it's just like a regular closing. Just once everything is signed and you go through it, then boom, that is it. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, you can, you can explain it, um, Asad. I don't have any problem with that. Um, let me just, before you get to that, Asad, uh, give me a second here. I just want to make sure anybody else, I want to make sure no one raised their hands, slide through the screens real quick. I uh, don't see any hands raised. All right. No other questions right. in regards to subject two, or does anybody have any questions in regards to subject two? If you have tenants and, and somehow the mortgage company did ex execute due on sale, what would happen? If they attempt to foreclose, that's extremely rare and hypothetical. Well, if they, if is, it is what it is. The the do on sale clause, I guarantee you, is in that mountain of paperwork that the seller signed, you know, thirty years ago. Well, not thirty years ago, but you know, five years ago, right? It's in there. So, um, um, okay, I got you, Bill. Um, so with that in mind, if they decide they want to execute the dual sale clause, they have all right to do so because there has been a transfer of title, um, or transfer of deed. And so they have the right to do that. It's the risk that is run, but it's one of those things that it just doesn't, that very rarely happens. If it happens, it's probably because you probably want to double check what's coming and what's going on in the neighborhood. Because, for example, where I'm at here now in Smyrna, um, a couple of years ago, they decided to move the uh, Brave Stadium, right? Now, I'm not saying this has happened, but this would be a reason why something like this would happen, right? The bank finds out that you have a subject too, and they're okay with it for the first two, three years. But now, all of a sudden, the, bank, the, the, um, the Braves are going to be buying up a whole bunch of property because they need to, break, they need to make this new park called SunTrust Park down here in Atlanta. And so um, they realize the bank realizes, holy crap, this little, you know, property that we only owe $70,000 on because the Braves are coming to town, it's going to be worth a lot more. Oh, do, do on sale clause, right? That's when something like that's going to happen. So if that happens, you still have an out because you still have some time. If you find that information out in that particular case, which this is, that's a real, um, not to do on sale clause, but a real story is when the Braves came, they, you know, they basically started buying up. A um, whole bunch of property, and um, it was actually forced. Um, sellers were forced to, to sell their property. Um, so um, um, it's called adverse possession, right? Oh, no, I'm sorry, that's not that's not adverse possession. It's called um, uh, I forgot the name of the freaking term. Eminent domain. Eminent domain. There you go. Eminent domain. Um, so um, basically, when the government sees that, hey, this is going to be for the good of the surrounding area. But if, and short of something like that happening, it's just probably not going to happen, man. Yo, so in that situation, uh, how, how could you get a mortgage? Because you already, you already got the deed in your name. Mm -mm, no, yeah. no, you can't. You okay. Can't. Um, how was it the deed goes? Remember the, hold up, did I miss? Did I miss some stuff? I have a question about a deal. Okay. How would you calculate an assignment fee for a subject to? Good question. Very, very good question. So I always work, I like win-win-win situations. And I understand, um, I understand what is a good deal. And you guys should understand what's a good deal or not, right? Just by doing some of the homework, you understand what's a good rate of return. So one of the things you want to ask your end investor is, um, you want to ask your end investor, what are their plans with this property? Are they, because if they're going to rent it, then what should you know? The rental rate for the, for, for the area, right? And so now you know, because you got the authorization form, you know how much they're paying in rent. You know how much it's going to cost for them to get in the property. 
and you know how much the rent is going to be so you can figure out what's a good return on investment, right? So that's what I would do. If the person is going to Airbnb it, this is why we talk about these different strategies in, on these coaching calls, right? If the person is going to Airbnb it, well, now you know how to figure out whether or not it's going to be a good Airbnb. And so if you find out that, man, I know an investor, if they, if they can make a 12% return on the money that they've put into it, remember, she's controlling 100, Alana's going to be controlling 140, 150,000, I forgot the exact number. Actually, I think it's like 150, no, don't worry about it. I think it's $140,000, right? She's going to be controlling this asset for about $10,000. Okay, so she's not coming out of pocket 140000 like she would if she was buying the property. She's only got to come out 10000 to control the asset, okay? So if she's coming out of her pocket 10000 and um, she's going to be renting it, then I can just do that calculation and figure out, okay, how much am I getting, how much is going in my pocket per month times 12, subtract my operating costs, divided by 10000 and that'll give me my percentage. So I, if I ask through qualifying, this is where things start coming together, right? Through my, my questioning of my investor and qualifying my investor. Remember we talked about this? You got to qualify your investors. Hey, Mr. or Mrs. Uh, investor, um, if I brought you a, a what, what type of deal, what type of percentages are you looking for? They say, oh, Tommy, if you can find me something that's a 10%, a 10 cap, I'll get it all day, all day. And I find you, so I'm saying, okay, well, if I give you a 10 cap, you're going to buy? Yeah, I'll, I'll buy. Okay. Now I see something and I do my math. And I'm like, shoot, I, with the math, I can get this person 15%. Well, I know they're going to buy at 10%. So I'm going to take, I'm going to add that, that value into the, my percentage. And maybe I'll give them an, an extra percent. So maybe I give them 11%, but whatever that extra is, I'm going to put in my pocket. Does that make sense? Am I explaining that? You guys understand what I'm saying? So it's, you have to understand and think critically about the numbers, right? What is going to, what, what does a good deal look like? Okay. And then on top of that, what does a good deal look like to your investor? So um, we're working on a property right now. It, it's, it's not a subject too, but you, it's going to drive the point home, right? We're working on a property now where the ARV is around 190. Okay. This is what I was talking about last week. Stop looking for the obvious abandoned houses. This house wasn't abandoned, right? Or didn't look abandoned. But through a couple of the little tricks I picked up on, by, like I tell you guys, look on the back side of the house. We, we call the person. It's an abandoned property, okay? Um, now, if I just did, you know, I wanna, if I just wanted to be really generous, right? I did 30% and then minus subtracted my repairs. And the seller wants $40,000. Matter of fact, let me show you this so you can, so you can get a visual because it's going to be Sometimes numbers, you need to see it. It's a little bit harder. All right. <clears throat> so, and I'm going to use my calculator. So I'll be going back and forth here and get all this stuff out. All right. So we got an ARV, all right, of 190K. Okay. So 190,000 times 0.7 equals 133K. So this right here is the investors all in. I'm gonna put AI, not for arrogance and, and uh, ignorance. All right, all in, okay? So they wanna be all in. Now, I promise you, if someone spends $50,000 on this property, they're, they're stupid, number one, or they don't know what they're doing, or they're over, they're over uh, renovating for that neighborhood. But I'm gonna give you 50. I'm going to say you need 50, all right? So when I subtract $50,000, okay, for renovations, that gives me 83K, okay? This is a real case. This is a situation we're working on currently right now, okay? The person that was going to take us a little bit of work, but the person who's in control of the property, they said, listen, all I want is 40K. Okay. Now, because I know the math, I know a buyer will buy it at this price. They're going to, a buyer will buy it at 83 because they're not even going to put 50. They're going to put about 35 into this property and they're going to be happy because they're going to make the difference between this and that 190. Okay. 
So how do I, how did I come up with my assignment fee? I said, okay, this is what my seller said he wants. This is where, because I know how to do this math, I know $83,000, this house is going to fly. It's going to sell. So my difference, so my, my, my assignment fee is going to be $40,000. Okay. Or $43,000 really. Okay. So you do the exact same thing when you're creating your assignment fee on the other side. All right. You're going to figure out if it's a, if it's a rental, you're going to figure out what the rents go for, how much the mortgage payment is, how much is the investor putting in times in, uh, do all that math and then figure out, okay, what'd you say you want, Mr. or Mrs. Investor? You want 10%? Well, shoot, right here is 15%. I got a deal for you. I got a steal for you. You're going to get 11%. I know you wanted 10, but you're going to get 11, but you're going to pay me $6,000 because I found this awesome deal for you. And guess what? If you don't want it, I'm just going to give it to another investor. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that makes sense. All right. Um, all right, let me get to some of these uh, people. Um, um, uh, I know uh, Assad, you were first. So if you want to come off mute real quick, quick, quickie, go ahead and hop on here. All right, can you hear me? Yep. All right, how's it going, Tom? Good, brother, uh, good. So here's the situation, basically. I was driving around, driving for dollars. I happened to be in the coming area, and um, I saw this house for sale by owner. At first, I was like, oh, I might be able to get it. It looked like something about 150, 180,000. I called them. They're motivated sellers, an elderly couple. Long story short, um, the guy's father owned it, passed away. Now he's got it on rent, but he wants to get rid of it. It has 10 acres on it. Okay. So, um, yeah, it was not 150, 180. It was 925,000. I spoke okay. to an investor. The investor said, okay, I'm going to get some guys in on it. Let's do it. Um, whatever happened, unfortunately, his wife's a big real estate agent as well. So they haven't really been getting back to them. I spoke to the owners today. They're like, we're very disappointed. He didn't show up. He didn't really call. You could have had the common courtesy, blah, blah, blah. But they're like, we really appreciate your help. We're going with a real estate agent to list it for 925. We have bought it down to 825. It went from 775 to 825. Now they're going up to 925 with a new real estate agent that's going to list it. But they liked me enough to say, hey, the real estate agent has agreed, though, that if you are able to get something in on the offer, you'll get the commission, not them. Uh, if we send us our email, can you give us your information? So that's okay. something like that on the contract. I don't want to look like an idiot because I'm not a real estate agent. I, I'm not an investor either. I don't know what they think I am exactly. How do I go about this? Well, you need to disclose, you need to figure out because it sounds like they're going to put the real estate agent is going to put you on the contract. You need to understand, they need to understand what's going on. Do they, you said they don't know that you, whether or not you're a real estate agent or not, correct? I, I, I don't think they do. No. Okay. I mean, I made it very clear that initially I thought I was going to be able to buy it. Um, little did I know it's 10 acres and it's next to the Polo Club neighborhoods. So okay. these are three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar homes. These are neighborhoods. So the guy that I was trying to work with, he was like, you know what? Instead of just buying that house and making a couple of properties on it, why don't we make a small subdivision with the right developers? And the communication has been lost. But I don't oh, want to. Do you, leave out on this so let me let me ask you this: Do you have a contract with this the seller? No, not at all. Everything is still up for grabs. Okay, so. Um, once the um, once the the real estate agent kind of gets involved, unless you already have a contract, that real estate agent is going to try to work their thing because the real estate agent their whole thing is that they're, they're, they 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 want to get paid, right? right? The only way they're going to get paid is if they have a listing agreement with them, and it sounds like they already do. Okay, so you need to have a contact. You need to have a a, a, a meeting with that real estate agent. <clears throat> You never meeting with that real estate agent okay? and, and talk to them and, and maybe just try to find a buyer for them, but say, Hey, listen, if I'm going to find a buyer, I know you got the listing agreement cause it sounds like that's what they already got. Right. But Hey, you know, I know you, uh, um, if I find a buyer for you, I want to, I want to receive a assignment fee because that's, that's really the only thing that you can, that you can, um, that you can do is you can work right. something in with the real estate agent. 
um, see. And see if they'll they're gonna do something you might actually have to do that now think about it. you might have to do that with your buyer your buyer might have to agree um to put something on the uh on the uh, uh addendum that right. they will pay you x amount of dollars for bringing them a buyer but that's a good example of why you want to you want to know what you're doing and to a point where you can make these decisions quickly because a day could cost you you know a lot of money as you can see right, right. so I, because you didn't you didn't really know and it's okay it's, it's okay to be new right but because you didn't know it it cost you a little bit of time which then they found a real estate agent which then cost you money right right potentially yeah. potentially, potentially cost you money but it, it, you would have a lot better position if you had it under contract already oh man basic mistake what a horrible mistake i hope everybody's learning from this um so all right so moving forward let's say the real estate agents like okay fine i'll do it what kind of percentage assignment fee should i ask for and what information do i give like what format again you go we're going right back to that same question on what i just explained right that uh -huh. your assignment fee is going to be based upon the value you provide so you have to do the math of what is you know you work backwards find out what it should be going for and then work backwards on that right now here i will tell you this with um with uh um higher end proper or, or big dollar item properties that 30 percent typically is not there right, right. because you know 30 percent or hundred thousand dollars is only thirty thousand dollars right 20 percent of a million dollars right that's two hundred thousand dollars right, right. So some, there's a lot of people that are willing to make 200,000, are willing to risk. Remember the percentage is still, you know, on the hundred thousand dollars, it's, you know, they're in it, they're all in it at 70%, right? And they're making 30% profit on the, on the million dollar property. They're all in it for 80% and they're making 20% profit. So the, the return on investment is smaller, right? But $200,000 is $200,000 in any yes. part of the world, right? Yes. So, so it gets it gets a little bit that that percentage gets smaller with the with the higher end property. So you got to keep that in mind. Thank you. I'll keep definitely keep that in mind. So when I email them my info, what kind of format? How should I state what I can do? What you want to do is you want to have a conversation with this real estate agent first, and not email them because you only know what you're going to be emailing. What are they looking for? They like again. They might only be having a conversation with you because they think that you're an agent. They find out that you're not an agent, right? Um, what you need to let them know because you're, you're not, and they're going to eventually find out if you are, if you aren't, um, you know, you need to, you need to figure out where, where they stand on that. And then again, it's going to be real basic. Hey, I'm a wholesaler. I found this property, um, you know, a little while ago and, um, I was already working on finding some buyers. I'd like to figure out how we can team up so we both can, uh, be a win, win, win situation for the seller, yourself and myself and our buyer. Um, okay. there's a way that I can work with you on that and then see what they say. Gotcha. The owner, he, he texted me his email. So I guess I'll just ask him to forward me the real estate agent's contact. Yeah. Instead of emailing him back the info, is that the way to go? Yep. Correct. Yep. All right. I guess that's it. Let's hope for the best. And if anybody out there is interested, let me, <laughs> let me know if there's a buyer. If you know of anybody, tell me as there you well. Go. That's the best. That's the best way. That's the best way to use the use this group, right? Is to right. Know. You never know. You never know. You never know. Yeah, I might be. You know, you might be sleeping on a couple mil. Yeah, you right. never know. It's crazy. I didn't know they had ten acres. I was thinking at first, let's make a couple of homes through easement, you know. And that guy's like, why don't we just make a miniature neighborhood on that thing? half an acre each home or one acre. I was like, wow, that's yeah. brilliant. And he's like, I know the right people. I don't know what's going on. He's a, he's a really good guy, but yeah, I don't know what happened. Um, so I got to find more. Okay. All right. All right. Let me get Appreciate you. Uh, no problem, brother. All right, Bill, uh, you had a question. What's good, fam? What's going on? So I have a um, deal I've been working on maybe the past uh, 60 days. Um, the seller's husband just passed last week. Uh, he's on the deed, but they've been separated. The house is on free and clear. They have tax issues, whatever. My question is, um, I just marketed to a few of my buyers. Some of them came by yesterday to come look at the property. Now when it's time to close the property, being that the husband died in test state, 
how how would I deal with his? Because now you know I can't have a, I won't have a signature for him. Yeah, and he doesn't. So is is the is the um, is it? You said they they were divorced. They were or se separated. Oh, uh, they, they were separated. They're so legally on on the deed. They're still showing up as uh, co-owners and owners to the property. Oh, okay. Like I said, he, he died in test state, so he doesn't have a will expressing you know his interest or who's to take over. You typically don't have to worry too much about that when it's husband and wife. Okay. Right. So when it's husband and wife, it's pretty, you know, it's a pretty smooth thing. It doesn't, even though he doesn't have a, a will, even though he doesn't have a will, it's pretty straightforward um, because both of them were at one point living together there, right? They might be separated now, but both of them were living together. The, the divorce wasn't finalized. Okay. Um, so typically it's going to just revert right to the wife or if it was the wife that passed away, right to the husband. So she basically takes the whole hundred percent so she can just sign for everything without his signature. I mean, still going to go, you're still going to, you know, go through the closing attorney and they'll make that decision whether or not they, you know, um, or the courts will make that decision if they need to go through the probate process. But if it does, it's going to be pretty straightforward because that's kind of like the hierarchy, right? You know, spouses and then kids, and then it goes down from there, you know, brothers, sisters, those type of people. So should I call my, my title company to let them know that he passed? To find out if um yeah I would I would let them know just get especially if they're going if they ain't gonna charge you and they'll give you some free free advice um right. and yeah I would I would I wouldn't I would be okay with reaching out to them all right I'll be okay I mean and, and if she's if she's on the more is she on the mortgage there's no mortgage I'm, on, I'm sorry on, on the deed on the deed yeah she's on the deed they're both on the deed oh then yeah that's that's a wrap. Yes, yeah, it's, it's so it's it's survivorship, right? So if the husband dies, you don't have to go through probate. That's it, she has full, she has full uh, yeah. rights to that property. So I don't I don't need to get her. So therefore, she don't need a death certificate for his signature to show none of that. She go, she should get a death certificate, but she, all she gonna do is show the show. Listen, you know, she gonna come to the closing table with the attorney, or pretty much before that happens. And this is why you should close talk to your title company or closing attorney. Um, so listen, this is what happened. What, do you, what paperwork do you need? Oh, we're going to need the death certificate. Um, and they'll probably pull everything in. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If she's on the deed, then there's two people that own a property. One of them die. Well, there's only one person that owns the property now. Right? Okay. Yeah, that's, cool. that's, 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 that's an easy one. All right. It looks. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Um... How is it that the deed goes in the name of your company, but the mortgage does not? Is it that the deed and mortgage are considered two separate entities? Yes, Mar. Um, remember what we talked about in the beginning, a car is, is different than a house. So in a car, when you, when you finance a car, the, the name of the financing company and your name go on the title of that car. A house is completely different. The deed is one instrument, the mortgage is another instrument, two separate instrument, instruments that don't necessarily talk with each other, okay? The mortgage is recorded, um, um, the mortgage you're dealing with a bank and the deed uh, shows ownership, okay? The mortgage, all you're doing with the mortgage, don't, don't, don't complicate this. When you are signing a mortgage, you're saying that you are guaranteeing that you're gonna pay back X amount, of X amount of dollars on a scheduled monthly or wherever that payment is, however it's scheduled, normally it's monthly, all right? And, the reason why you're doing that is it's secured by this particular property. And so what you're, all you're saying when you sign a mortgage is that if I don't pay Chase Bank, Wachovia, no, Wachovia is not around no more, uh, Chase Bank of America, whoever, if I don't pay them, they're, then they're going to take this property, okay? But, I mean, it's, it really could be whatever the bank or you deem as collateral. It's just that most of the time when you think, when you do a mortgage, it's a property, right? Mortgages are typically associated with a piece of property. But the actual ownership is conveyed through a deed, okay? I know, I know it's different than what you maybe have thought, but that's, that's how it really works, okay? Uh, yeah, right. Cool. Um, wholesale deals over 220K does the end buyer uh, use cash or hard money. If hard money is involved, then does the wholesaler get paid the same? Yes. Hard money, cash, soft money. 
it doesn't matter. Um, uh, however the deal works, the only difference is that if, if I'm the end buyer and I literally have $200,000 cash, which is dumb for me to do that with that house, but let's just say I want to do that. Excuse me. The only difference is that at, at the closing, it's a little bit smoother in a sense of there's less paperwork to sign. Okay. Okay. So if I'm the person that has the cash, if I'm the person that has the cash and I'm taking $200,000 out of my bank account and go straight from my bank account, it's wired to ABC lawyer escrow account or whatever your lawyer or title attorney title company is. It goes into their account. Then we all sit at a table and you guys will notice if anybody's been to a closing, there's always a bowl of chocolate, right? You just sit there and eat the chocolate and we drink a little coffee and we laugh and we make everybody feel nice and warm and fuzzy. And then as the wholesaler, the wholesaler sits there, you got your, your seller over here, your buyer over here. And then that money, they say, okay, here's, here's your check, uh, Mr. or Mrs. Seller. Here's the HUD, well, here's the HUD statement explaining everything. This is where all the money is going. This is why you're getting paid this. Boom, boom, boom. Sign here. Here's your check. All right, Tommy, here's your, or I'm sorry, um, uh, who, who asked that question? Trev, um, here is your check for the assignment fee. And all right, Mr. Holt, here's the keys. Here's the property, okay? If the hard money is doing, hard money lender is there, most of the time the hard money guy or girl is not going to be there. They're going to wire over and send over a whole bunch of documents. And those documents you will have to sign acknowledging that you're going to pay on these scheduled amounts and how you're going to draw the money for rehabs and all those other things. Okay. But as far as the assign, as far as the wholesaler, my process is exactly the same. That process takes a little bit longer. So the only thing that matters to me is I get to eat more chocolate because I'm sitting at the, at the closing table for a little bit longer, right? Because they have to sign more paperwork, but essentially it's the same exact thing. Right. Um, if she has right of survivorship, yes, but uh, she's on the deed. So um, I have one con under contract. Congratulations, Yusuf. One, yeah, one under contract like that. Now, cool. My attorney used the affidavits, death certificates, and family tree to establish heirship. So um, if they're on the deed, they shouldn't have to do that. Besides, the only thing you need to say is that where's the death certificate because. because if um if he's not really dead you know his wife is trying to you know um just liquidate some assets so she can go on go to aruba with her new boo i mean he wants to know that right so um but if he's dead she's the only person that has title to the company to the property right for i mean think about it she might have been the one paying the mortgage the whole time so you know she has rights she has right to that property she has the sole right to that property right Kids, kids are on the right to that property. She does. They're both on the mortgage. They're both on the deed. That's it. Cool. All right, fella, family. Excuse me. Family, family. Um, I think we're good. Um, I know you guys are tired of listening to me. My voice is breaking up a little bit. So um, we're going to do this like we did before. I heard you guys were over here um, where I left, and I kind of left the meeting going. I heard you guys like that. Um, I heard Antoine broke out, had a little freestyle. Appreciate your freestyle, Antoine, coming out with a new uh, wholesaling mixtape um, in two, uh, late 2019. Um, but you guys can hop on here. You guys can exchange ideas. Um, obviously, be respectful to one another. Uh, talk amongst each other. But, um, yeah, I'm good. I'm done. Um, no, he dead. <laughs> he dead dead. I went to the memorial services. He said he dead dead. All right, um, but you guys have a blessed one, man. I don't think anybody has any other questions, so I'm gonna let this one roll out. I love you guys, and uh, let's let's be um, let's be intentional this week. Before, actually, let me say something real quick before before we go. Um, we have a lot of people that are new here. Um, we have some some people that have been on for a while, okay, um, and um, I, for the most part, I think some of you have heard this. If you haven't. My job is not just to give you information. Like you getting this subject to information is dope, is good information. Um, hope you guys understand it. But what's more important that I think that you guys take away from these, these interactions, is what's more important is that you find some type of rejuvenation throughout the week to keep pushing just to the next phone call. You guys, some of you guys, um, um, some of you guys, I'll talk about that in the Kia. Some of you guys, you know, if you go on to church 
or you go to some religious services, right? Like, you know how uh, if, you, if you used to go to church on Sunday or Saturday or whatever day you go to, you, you worship, right? You know, you, you go to church and then you go to the, you, the next day on Monday or, or Sunday, you're feeling good. Tuesday rolls around, your coworker gets on your nerves. Wednesday, that same coworker, you're about to curse him out, right? And then you make it all the way to Sunday again, and you feel rejuvenated again, right? So that's what these calls um, do, right? That's what, that's what they're, they should do for you guys. But in that moment of when you're feeling good and you can conquer the real world, you need to apply some, some action immediately, immediately, because if you don't, something through the week is going to throw you off, right? I promise you, I promise you guys, if you guys are, start, are putting action in on a repeated basis, on, on, a, on a steady basis, things are going to start moving. Momentum is going to start happening. Um, people on my team, they can kind of feel it now. They feel like, man, we're getting close to another deal. We're getting close to a deal because they feel the momentum going. They're getting the phone calls coming. The, the deals are going out, contracts are being signed. And that's a really, really good feeling. But that only, it's the hardest thing to do. It's the hardest thing to create in the beginning. It's easy when you already have done deals, right? But in the beginning, it, this part right here, if you haven't done a deal, is the hardest part. So if you can get through this and get a deal, know that that's a huge, huge win. And that's why we celebrate it because it really is a huge win because now psychologically it's become real for you, but more importantly, spiritually in your soul and your heart, it's, it's become real to you. And now you can get that momentum going. All right. So you hey, Tommy. definitely got to do it. Yes. Go ahead, Eddie. Hey man, I just want to say thank you, bro. That was, that was a great, great way to end it out. Um, and you know, I was looking forward to this particular topic. So I'll definitely get back on the, uh, on the replay. The last week's um, topic, I didn't see the upload on on Facebook. I was trying to look for it. Did, did something happen with it, or can I find it? Should it? Be up there. I'll double check it. I'll double check it. If it's not, then I'll put it up there. Okay, appreciate it. Thanks, I, man. It should be up there. Has anybody else seen it? No one else seen it. No one. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. That's, who's that? I'm, sorry, the babies. I I love babies, especially when they're not mine. Oh hi! You gonna make you gonna make mommy some money? You gonna buy mommy an apartment complex? Oh oh hey! <laughs> cool cool. Um. All right, let me see. Hey Nakia, uh, hit hit me up, Nakia. Um, after this is over, um, and I'll hop right on and, and try to figure that out. Uh, hey Tommy, do we need? To, how do we get on Monday morning? Oh, Brandon, you know what? It's the, um, his, 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 um, and I'm sorry, I've said this before. I keep forgetting we get people that are new. So his calls are the same every, like, his, like you know how my Zoom links are different every single time, all right? His is, his is the same. So it's the same one that I posted. And um, maybe I'll try to just try to find it and repost it, but it's in the thread. Um, Barry, what is the Facebook group link? So Barry, what I need you to do, I need you to do, Barry, as I need you to go to, um, just go to Facebook in the little search bar up top. Just type the name of the course, E2E, and that's the letters E and the number two, E, Wholesaling Edition, and you'll find it. It'll pop up. It'll ask you for three questions. You answer those three questions. I'll get notified, and then I will, act, uh, will give you access. I normally do the access towards the end of the day, unless I just happen to be on Facebook and I see it. Uh, appreciate the Miata. Hope we brought value to you. Uh, all right. Cool. Nikia hit me up so we can make sure that we, we make that work uh, for you. All right. Now I'm going for real, for real. So I'm going to stop recording. You guys enjoy. And uh, see you.